here with Branford Marcellus, a dear friend of mine from high school, Parliament Funkadelic days. Yes, sir. As you may have heard, in addition to his work in music, Branford and Harry Connick teamed up to put together Musicians Village, a project to help bring New Orleans musicians and other New Orleanians, particularly low-income New Orleanians, back to the city at a time when rents were unaffordable. And the point in part was to be able to provide housing that these people could own at a price cheaper than rents were, were going for at the time. So in the fall of 2005, a little more than a month after the storm, Branford and Harry were driving to Houston talking about this idea. And in the course of talking about the conversation, you also hit upon a gem about the nature of creativity in response to this kind of situation. Uh, reiterate that for the folks who are watching here. Okay, well that was, we, Eric and I were talking, I'm sorry, Lola and I. <laughs> old school, old school. I understand. Lola and I were talking. And uh, there's a lot of press that comes out and they say, oh, you guys invented this and you guys did that and you guys. And I never was able to, to, to word it right because I, I said, well, we really didn't do anything. And I, I started reading this, this, this great book on, on Thelonious Monk, the jazz pianist. And he was asked a question about revolutionizing music. And the question was, when did you realize that the music that you were playing was, was, had changed the course of jazz? And he says, well, that's, that's not what we did. He says, all we did was the same thing that the guys who came before us did, is that we tried to play music that had great melodies and was swinging and all that other stuff that happened, well, that just happened. But we didn't set out to do that. So when Harry and I were, were driving down, you know, arguing about whether it should be a school and it should be this, and then Harry said, well, I'm working with Habitat. We should build some homes. And that was it. Yeah, man, let's build some homes. We didn't say, look, man, let's build 80 homes and a music education center. And it was just like, let's build some homes. That's great. And we played for the evacuees in Houston, in the Astrodome, we went home and then two days later, our manager called and said, okay, well you gotta fly to New Orleans because this home thing is taking off. We're gonna build all these homes. And even then we weren't sure because we started asking people for help and then the money starts coming in and you don't know what to expect. It's not like you can say, yeah, well we're gonna get $5 million easy with this thing. $5 million came in. So then it's like, well, we can build 80 homes. And then more money came in, so well, what are you gonna do? Hey, let's build a music education center which goes back to Harry's school because Harry still wanted to have that damn school built so it's you know <laughs> so so here we are but but when when you when you come up with ideas there's no way well you can sit there and say it's going to be this thing it's going to be huge it's going to be great it's going to be significant but there's no way that you really know that that's going to happen so the most important thing is to come up with an idea that you th you think has some value and if you're lucky all of the circumstances that are need to make it a success converge at the same time and if you study history, a lot of times, events, multiple things start happening to sway history one way or the other at the same time. And a lot of those things, you have absolutely no control over them. And you come up with an idea and things just, Katrina comes along. And as, as P.W. Bolta said, when he was talking about his, his working with the ANC before they finally came to have democracy in South Africa, they asked him about the, the, the concept of having to deal with a terrorist organization because the ANC used violence. And P.W. Bolta says, History has shown us that oftentimes violence is the midwife of change. And Katrina was our violence. And when you look at all the things that are happening now, how the education system is changing, how the police force is changing, how our interpretation of what it means to elect a democratic official to represent us is changing, all of these things converged at the same time to make the village become what it has become. And it's, it's the help of thousands of people who gave money, who built, the musicians who came back, who worked on their homes, it's, it's the, the politicians, who, it's just been an amazing, an amazing thing. And as much as I'd love to take the credit for this, I, I really can't see how we can. It was, we, we came up with an idea and it became larger than we ever would have dreamed. Mm. Well, in keeping with the South African analogy, one of the things that was striking to me is that second line parades may have been political implication, but I never remember them being overtly political. And we come back and the brass bands and the second line organizations are protesting for the right to return. They're protesting the closing of Charity Hospital. They're protesting discussions about uh, shrinking the footprint of the city and not allowing people to come back. And in that sense, the culture transformed in the context of this, this great disaster. But you also talk about the idea of the musician's village having to define itself and in many ways your work having been mostly done now. Yeah. What do you see, hap what is happening so far, and what do you see happening as we move forward in that regard? 
Well, I, I think if you think of ideas as a, as a seed, and you often hear people call ideas a seed, the germination process, like, you know, to, it's almost a re reiteration. Uh, the soil has to be right. The bugs have to not get it. It can't rain too much. It can't rain too little. All these factors have to, to happen. And in the, in the musician's village, for instance, uh, the musicians start moving in, and the next thing you know, they're, do, they're working together. And it was about three weeks ago when I, I saw an article on a record that was made by, uh, I, I'm, I, don't know, I think, a, a musician from northern Louisiana and a blues musician doing two guitars singing together. And that probably would not have happened were it not for the proximity with which these two gentlemen live, uh, you know, next to each other. And these are, are the sorts of things that we envisioned happening in the village, but not the sort of things that we could actually mandate, because at that point it would be so artificial that it, would have, it wouldn't work. It would be insincere, and it would have no effect. So you, you throw some seeds in the ground, and you hope they grow, and sometimes they don't, and sometimes they grow and become amazing. And that's the hope. Well, what you're looking at on the screen now are some actual pictures of homes in the musician's village. And what is striking to me is the extent to which what we're attempting to do architecturally is have houses that are raised off the ground and therefore safe from floods, as the homes in New Orleans traditionally were safe from floods. But by the same token, taking a look at vernacular New Orleans architecture, so this looks like a New Orleans neighborhood all the way down to these wild colors, which are always my favorites. Mm -hmm. But you, know, you talk about the stuff that happens organically by the fact that you have musicians and other cultural figures, because you cannot simply say only musicians can apply for this, this, this housing. You have um, folks who are, are visual artists, folks who are all different kinds of genres of musicians. But there's another factor about this, which is not quite so organic, which is the creation of the Ellis Marcellus Center, which is what we've been working together on. And the idea is to actually teach young people, both the sons and daughters of village residents and also folks outside of the confines of the musician's village, to come in and learn about various styles of Louisiana music and also classical music and other forms that may not necessarily be associated with New Orleans. The other thing we're looking at is trying to create in a more concerted and a more um, premeditated fashion the sort of cross-pollinization and try to see how we can get people who might otherwise not have encountered each other to be a part of this kind of thing. So, Give me some sense of how this differs in your mind from the school project that you were not so crazy about when you and Harry were beginning your first conversations. Well, the, the, the biggest problem with the school is not, no, we shouldn't do a school, but schools are, 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 as we all know as New Orleanians, schools are overtly political. So if you're going to build a school, what's going to be the curriculum? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you have to, you, you have to have, you have state mandates. You have to teach these classes, this classes, there's all this, bureaucracy that was involved that I'm absolutely sure neither he nor I wanted to get involved in this. And then he goes on the road and works, I go on the road and works, who's going to mind the store? So in a situation like this, the musicians themselves get together and they, you know, it's, it's a, a house party, it just doesn't even matter. You see them walking down the street, their kids are playing together. And in that kind of situation, it reminds me of the New Orleans I, I grew up in. Because, you know, when we were kids, musicians used to get together. And it wasn't, I, no one ever really called me a jazz musician until I moved to New York. In, in New Orleans, we didn't have jazz music, it was just musicians. So when we would go here to Neville Brothers, he'd say, you know, you know when we go to hear him, then uh, Art would always say, yeah, bro, how's your daddy doing? You know, tell your daddy I say what's happening. I mean, it didn't matter. It wasn't like, you know, what are you doing over here? You're a jazz guy. You don't belong over here. When we played in the orchestra, you know, they didn't say, oh, you jazz guys, what are you doing in the orchestra? Nobody said, you know, don't play in the orchestra. You, you got to pick a music. I played in an R&B band when I lived here more than I did anything. And it was just, it was a great experience because you had all these musical experiences, you know, that, that kind of, they were severely diminished once people started playing, once DJs started playing in clubs. Because before the DJ thing in the late 70s, it was musicians playing in clubs. And thank God I lived in New Orleans because I was a 14-year-old kid playing in nightclubs. And, you know... The club owners were very explicit. <laughs> Your daddy was the same age when he started playing in these clubs, and the rules are the same. If I see you drinking other, anything other than a Coke, you're going to have a sore behind, and I'm going to tell your daddy, and he's going to take care of you, and so on and so on. So the whole environment, they looked out for us, and they nurtured us. And it, 
a lot of that is largely absent now as the culture is, is the clubs become more for tourists more than for the locals. The village can kind of pick up the slack because even now musicians are going to each other's houses and having jam sessions and listening to guys. And when the center opens up and we start having concerts in the center, it'll be similar to hearing uh, that, that, that great uh, uh, Jelly Roll Morton compilation set when he would talk about how a lot of uh, jazz musicians used to go to the, to the New Orleans Opera House before it burned down and hear opera, and they could just go check out the music and how the music influenced the kind of music that they wrote. And this is the ultimate goal, is to just get musicians to steal ideas from all different sorts of places, regardless of the kind of music they prefer to play, and just use those elements in their music. My brother, we got time for half a question. I was told specifically when we get down in a minute, Okay. Got it. Quick. Half what a question. made you what think is it? that? Okay. <laughs> That's a heavy question. What do you? Here I am playing straight man once again. To yeah, right. The interlocutor. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Mr. But interlocutor, sir. Yes, Mr. Let me. Okay. I ain't gonna indulge that foolishness. <laughs> but look, I, I think time's up, man. We got As go. we walk up, what made you think that there was enough culture left in New Orleans post Katrina when everybody was pronouncing us dead, so that this thing could happen? Well, I mean, cities don't die. They don't. You know. It, I have a, was a, you know, I don't really have an adversarial relationship with the press. Yeah, I do, actually. I have an adversarial relationship with the press. So when you're sitting there and your town's been decimated and they ask you something as inane as, well, do you think the city can come back? Like, all the buildings are still sitting here, <laughs> even, though, you know, even, you know, except the ones that got washed, washed out. And I'm looking at the buildings and the Tuxedo Brass Band is in Phoenix. So I did this one interview and I said, well, you know, Phoenix is an incredibly cultural city, which it's not. And, uh, <laughs> but I, but, but I, I went on with this thing. I said, you know, the, the Tuxedo Brass Band is in Phoenix, and my God, they must be having a great time. It's a cultural mecca, you know, Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix has so much culture, and I'm pretty sure that when the Phoenix Suns win a game, everybody says, hey, let's go hear the Tuxedo Brass Band, and they celebrate, and they do the second line, and the guy's going, yeah, yeah, and I'm looking at him saying, man, what, how stupid are you? I mean, you know, <laughs> I finally said, I said, well, when the novelty of them being wears off, they're going to start saying, where can I get a bag of red beans for 99 cents? Not in Phoenix. Where can I get a green pepper? Certainly not in Phoenix. Where and am I'm, I going to play? Where am I? It, it, it was logical that the musicians were going to come back here because this is, there's no place like New Orleans in this entire world, but definitely in this country. No place like it. So we are back. We're back.